most important is nutrition. You gotta eat right. I mean, you could be working out, you can't out exercise a bad diet, let's face it. Um, you just can't, you don't, there's not enough, enough hours in a day to, to burn all those calories. Clearly, just that you would think you were gonna die or have I a heart literally, attack. Yes. Anytime you start talking with what if, you gotta watch out because that's when you, and that's, that takes the coping skills and it takes understanding that this is an anxiety issue. When you start hearing in your mind, what if, you gotta stop right there, turn it around. Today, personal trainer Greg O'Gallagher is back. He tells you how to get the perfect body, get in shrink wrap shape. And then Emily Francis on one of the most common forms of mental illness, anxiety. She's author of Anxiety Sucks. She's been there, done that, and tells you how she turned her life around. But up first, Greg O'Gallagher. So welcome back, Canadian How's it going? G. That's right, that's me. <laughs> By the way, I don't think I ever clarified last time. You told me that actually Greg is what your middle name, right? Not Greg is my middle name. name, and Alan would be my first name. Okay, well, I'm sorry that it's not your first name, but other than having a yeah. first name of Greg, the next best thing is to have Greg for the middle well, name. Well, you know what? If I actually go by my, I go by my middle name. It's my, it's a family yeah, tradition. Good for yeah, good you. Good. I like yeah. that tradition. Okay, so today you're going to tell us how to get the perfect body. That's this right. This is worth somebody competing or just the, this, anybody out there This is pe people that work out and have a goal in mind. They want to look good. You know, a lot of people don't know. I mean, do, do they want to get huge? Do they want to get lean and cut? Um, or somewhere in the middle? And the answer is somewhere in the middle. I mean, if mm. you're watching um, Hollywood movies, you see the action stars. They're not big, bulky, steroid guys. That's not, that's not what you, you want to go after. And you don't want to be too lean and, too lean and thin. It's, it just, it's not enough. You got to go for the perfect balance. You want to look like... So um, Arnold had the perfect balance? You know what? Um, that would be a little bit too much. I think too a lot much. of girls, a lot of people out there would think that that is kind of ex uh, excessive, excessive muscle. Mm -hmm. But you, like, the goal should be, you know, to look like a Greek god. You don't have to be huge, and, and you know, being lean and tone, like I said, is not quite enough. So there's a balance there, and it's it's a hard balance, it's a fine balance, and that's one of the reasons why you guys shouldn't be, like, people shouldn't be taking steroids. Because if you want to look like a pumped up bodybuilder that looks like stupid in clothes, I mean. The only time they look normal is at the gym. I mean, then, then take steroids, but it's not even necessary. And so when it comes to getting the perfect body, the first thing you gotta keep in mind is, it's a mental game. Mm -hmm. If you can uh, cultivate a burning desire to achieve your goals, you're halfway there. And the way you do that is through a subconscious mind. You have to visualize every day when you wake up, when you're going to the gym, when you're walking to work, when you're eating food, when you're going to bed. You gotta imagine yourself as if you already achieved that goal, mm -hmm. as if you look like a Greek god, as if you're ripped, um, lean and in shape. And if you can so do that, visualization is the key. It's, I've it's, heard that it's lot, so, so important. It's really... I mean, if you can do that, if you can get into that state, you're not gonna want to eat that bag of chips, and you're not gonna want to half acid at the gym, you know what I'm saying? You're going to want to give Wait, it... did you say have acid at the gym? Half acid, half acid. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's a, yeah. Uh, you're going to want to give it your own. You want to go in there 110%. And that's the, that's the first thing. And you're going to stick with your goal. You're not going to, you're not going to flake around or, or, or give up. So now once you get that thing, that's the first most important factor. When, but is, is this what you do? Have you, is that how you got... You, of you of were course. Visualizing? I, okay. I visualize when I go to the gym, I get ready. Um, but you're always visualizing you, not somebody else. Like I visualize how I want to look. How you want to look. Okay. And, and I, I imagine as if I'm already there. That's so much more powerful. I heard someone say they put a picture on the refrigerator. Should you mm -hmm. put a picture on the refrigerator? Of how you want. Of how you want. Yeah, yeah. If you're if you're one of those people that you know you you walk, you know you, you resort to food. Uh, you can't leave the kitchen. If you have a picture of of you know either someone you want to look like, because you can't really take a picture of you from the future. You know, <laughs> well, not yet at least. Or from the past. I don't know. Yeah, yeah from the past. So if you can get if you can get that picture if you can get a picture there, that's going to motivate you not to go for uh, whatever's in the fridge. Then then do it. And so once you get that in order, then it, it comes down to training. It comes down to nutrition. It comes down to you know. Uh, doing everything in your power to build to build that physique, and the first the first thing which is most most important is nutrition. You got to eat right. I mean, you could be working out. You, you, I mean, you can't out exercise a bad diet. Let's face it. Um, you just can't, you don't. There's not enough enough hours in a day to, to burn all those calories. So when it comes down to nutrition, it's all about getting in touch with your body, knowing how much your body needs, and then it's so natural, and that's when life becomes more enjoyable, as opposed to having to count calories and oh, I have to eat now. It just, it's not fun. And so the way you become in touch with your body is you have to start listening to yourself. Slow down when you're eating. Don't chew down your food. Um, what I did, what really helped me get um, 
in touch with what my body truly needs was I went three days on very low calories. I had like a protein shake for breakfast um, with some vitamins, protein shake for lunch and vitamins, and a salad with chicken. Uh, oh, I saw that on your Facebook page. Yeah, where somebody um, had it was, a, it was the diet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, what did he call it? The protein protein, protein uh, uh, shake, salad, pro, yeah. salad shake diet. And after doing that for three days. Whew, all those carb cravings I had before, they're gone. Now I've, I'm more focused and I can, I can really, I'm more in touch with my body, in other words. That was roughly how many calories a day? It was about 1,200. 1,200. 1,200. So it's not something you want to do for an extended period of time, but for the short term, to kickstart into a diet, it's, it's an awesome, awesome way. So is that how you get in shrink wrap shape, as you well, say? Well, I'll, I'll get to that later. Don't okay. jump the gun on me there, oh, Greg. Okay. Come on. We okay. got we to stick, stick to the schedule here. All right. <laughs> no, um, so, so then once you get the diet in order, that comes down to training. If you're dieting down, you're trying to get cut, you have to strength train. It's critical if you want to maintain your muscle. Mm -hmm. They had a, you know, they actually had a, a group of uh, two true groups of people, uh, both on really low calorie diets, like 1,000 calories per day. Uh, one group did, uh, did cardio training. Uh, about 90 minutes, three times a week, and the other group did strength training, same time. Which group think lost more weight? So I'm gonna ask you. I would want to say cardio, but it's, I think you're gonna tell me the opposite. Well, actually, you're right. The cardio training group lost more weight. Oh, they did. Okay. You know why they lost more weight? Because they lost muscle. Mm -hmm. So the group that did strength training actually lost more fat, but they maintained muscle, so they didn't lose as much weight. But at the end of the day, they look way better. So strength training is critical. So you don't do a lot of cardio? Well, I'll get to that. Uh, yeah, I'll get to that later. I mean, cardio is good, but a lot of people go about doing it the wrong way. And so the way to get the best benefit from cardio is if, you're, is if your uh, diet is already in place, if you're eating properly, then you don't have to do tons and tons of cardio. And the best form of cardio um, in those circumstances is just slow uh, cardio at 65% of your Turning heart rate. Turning the remote? Uh, you know what? I, I just just walk. Oh yeah, <laughs> no, no, not that slow. Okay, yeah. I mean, like walking is great exercise. Your body is you're not going to burn as many calories as running, but you're actually gonna, you're not going to burn your, your muscle tissue. And in addition to that, your body's going to use a higher percentage of fat as fuel, which is what we want at the end of the day. Um, whereas if you do steady, steady state cardio at a faster pace, you're going to burn a little bit of muscle. You burn a little bit of muscle too, um, and your body's going to be using a higher percentage of carbs for energy, and that's not really what you want, given that we're on a low calorie diet, we don't want to get in a depleted state because that's going to cause cravings later. So when they say you're in the fat burning zone? The fat burning versus... zone is at like 65% of your heart rate. But now if you want to get the maximal fat burning benefit, what you have to do is you have to go into, first start your cardio workout with intense intervals or sprints. That's going to boost up your body's, your body's uh, HGH, human growth hormone levels, your, mm -hmm. the natural, your, your natural fat burning hormone. It's going to boost that up. It's going to cause all your fat cells, your triglycerides to be released into the bloodstream. So now when you go back to do your slow, slow, steady cardio, your body's going to be burning way more fat. And that's what people usually don't do that. You know, people either do, they do interval training or they do steady cardio. They never combine the two. And to get the best results, that's what you have to do. Okay, we've got one minute left. Are you going to tell me about the shrink wrap? Shrink wrapped effect. Let's get down to it. So basically when people get ready for an event, they diet down, they lose a bunch of weight um, and expect to look great. It doesn't happen that way. You see, your skin lags behind. As you lose weight, uh, your, your body becomes smaller, but your skin slightly lags behind and that blurs muscle definition. So mm -hmm. if you want to look your absolute best, get to your leanest state, you know, uh, ideally one to two months before, before whatever it is you're getting ready for, and then maintain that state, then add a little bit of muscle. So increase your calories a little bit and do, do some uh, high volume strength training. So you're gonna do more sets, uh, more reps, less rest. That's gonna build a quick muscle size, get that pump going, and now your skin is gonna shrink wrap around your body and you look ultra ripped and shredded. All right, well thank you very much, Grego Gallagher. I think he had so much energy in that, I think I lost a few pounds just listening to him there. <laughs> That's right. We'll be right back. And we are back. Joining me now is Emily Francis. She's the author of Anxiety Sucks. Great to have you here today, Thank you Emily. Thank so much. Thank you for, for letting me be here. Well, the statistics that I've heard are something like 18% of the American population is affected by anxiety, um, 40 million Americans. It's a lot of people. I would actually think it's a lot higher than that. Higher than that. I would, I would absolutely, especially with the recession, mm -hmm. I would say that the percentage, because I know the New York Times just came out with an article about how prevalent anxiety has become in our community, not just because people that are prone to anxiety these days, but because of the recession and the things that are happening in our world right now, really have people up in arms and, and their chemistry, if you will, is sort of changing because it's, it's very difficult to cope with when we're not used to that. When did you first know 
know you had a problem or when did it strike it, it, in your whole life or was there a certain no. age or it was a certain age uh, you know honestly I didn't even know what anxiety was mm -hmm. and uh, my father passed away very suddenly when I was a teenager and from that moment because he was so healthy and he died playing tennis and he dropped of a major heart attack and it was almost like nobody discussed anything. I didn't go to counseling so I started just sort of compiling things into a compartment down deep in my soul and I didn't ever know that I had an issue until I hit my mid-twenties. And then all of a sudden, well actually it was the end of college and I hadn't had a lot of sleep and I had my first panic attack which I completely believed was a heart attack and I make my roommate drive me to the emergency room. I go running in like a maniac screaming, I'm dying, I'm having a heart attack. You know, I, they put me in a room, they don't even do any tests and they say, how much sleep have you had? Here's a Xanax, go on home. Oh. And I thought, oh, okay, that was a one-time deal, good, good. <laughs> and that was it. And I didn't. So they just knew, they didn't even do a they test. They just itself. knew. Wow. I was a college cheerleader, I was super healthy, and they didn't even, they didn't even take my vitals, really. But I mean, you know, was, you hear every once in a while about like these young athletes who die really bizarrely at like 16 or 18. In the heat so and they, all those maybe things. Maybe they should they have really done a should test, have. you know? They really should have, and I wish they would have. And honestly, I, 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 I called it a wonder pill. I never knew what it was that I even took. I mm. went home and I slept for days. And then anxiety really wasn't a part of my life for several years. And part of that is because I was in college. So if I I was feeling remotely antsy, guess what? I'd go out. So we'd go have drinks. It, it, it wasn't, you know, now that I know That's one way to deal is, with anxiety. Correct. Let's hit the bar. <laughs> I didn't know. So it was like, oh, you know what? I'm feeling a little odd today. Let's hit the bar. Let's go. And then when I hit 25, I stopped drinking. And it wasn't the alcohol. It's just that you always find something to take away your what you're thinking about. And so that was my way back then was I'd just go party. And I really thought that I was a lighthearted, you know, everything's cool. Let's just have a good time. And then something hit. And it was all of a sudden I started dealing with my father's passing all these years later and I started to understand that I actually have an issue I have a problem and it can't be fixed with going out and having a good time and it can't be fixed you know I honestly I thought that it was just a little you know bump in the road except this bump kept happening and then it became so overwhelming that I couldn't really I couldn't really be present to my life anymore and that's when I really started to so, see So, I mean, it was help. literally just that you would think you were going to die or I have a heart attack? Yes, or, or just, I would always yeah. have these, you know, I was taking yoga and Tai Chi and all of these incredible exercises, and they all focused on your breath. But when you're anxious and you're always afraid of losing your breath, any time that you had, I had like a breath that was out of balance, it would immediately trigger a thought. Oh my gosh, what if, what if now I'm really sick? What if this is a problem? You know, you start the what if cycle. And any time you start talking with what if, you got to watch out because that's when you and that's that takes the coping skills and it takes understanding that this is an anxiety issue when you start hearing in your mind what if you got to stop right there turn it around step back calm yourself and understand that your self-talk is now damaging well and, and that's the interesting thing as you said the other day when we were talking that you know, part of me wants to think you can just rationalize it or, you know, know how things are. But you tried everything. I mean, you, you were doing, everything. you know, yoga, meditation, Eastern, and none of it really I did worked. Eastern healing. I did allopathic. I, I went to my doctor and I went to a psychiatrist mm -hmm. and I went to a psychologist. I did EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing. Mm -hmm. I, I tried the regular ways. I went to yoga. I lived in an ashram. I studied Tai Chi. I was at the wow. parks every morning. You'd see me outside standing by a tree. I went to Native American medicine people. I did soul recovery and extraction. I walked on fire. I have done an insurmountable amount of things to try to, to heal my body from the inside out, from the root to tip, holistically. And what I didn't understand is, working. correct, what I didn't understand is the mind and the brain, they are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. So you have to know how to treat both as they are. So the brain is an organ. It is an organ in the body that is responsible for the chemicals. So that might need some chemical intervention. I'm not a huge fan of medication. I took a lot of herbs, but when I did finally cave and give medication a try after seven years of being incredibly judgmental towards it, wow. it, it, and I only take, like I told you, a half of the smallest adult dose. I do believe this country over medicates. I do believe that we have to take control of our bodies and our health and understand what's the smallest amount that we can take that will give us a healthy result. So I've never even taken the lowest adult dose. But all the work that I did for my mind then started to actually lock in and work because now the chemicals are balanced. So now all the meditation and all the beautiful skills that I had acquired over the years, they finally work. 
Yeah, and because on the one hand, I mean, I'm one of those people who wants to believe in like mind over matter and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. But sometimes, I mean, it's like, you know, if you break your leg, I mean, mind over matter is only going to get you so far. You might still have a broken leg. Or you, you might have to there do something. There is still a slice across so. the bone. And it's unfortunate because a lot of people view it as an either or. You are either holistic or you are non-holistic. Either you go with medication or you're a, medica you're, you're a meditator and you understand the value of e body's energy. And the truth is, you, it's, it's a little bit detrimental to be either or when it comes to your healing. The, the best way that you can possibly heal is to be both, is to open up your body, your mind, your heart, and your spirit to what is best for you and not listen to a lot of the naysayers and just really try to figure out what your triggers are. I don't think medication should be your first option ever. Mm. I think it should be after you have already utilized so many other healing modalities because I do think there's such amazing things out there that can do the trick. I mean, like with the recession, that's a temporary anxiety. The kind of anxiety that I went through is a very, it's a chronic, you know. Okay, so do, there is temporary and there is chronic. There is, I mean, yes. It, it can just be passing? It can be passing, yes. Okay. Like the four things that contribute the most to anxiety, death of a friend, family member, loss of a job, uh, moving, and divorce. Those are, that doesn't mean that you're prone to social anxiety disorder or agoraphobia where you're afraid to leave your house. This is a temporary, you're having a really hard time transitioning, of course you're gonna be anxious. And maybe medication is necessary for this small little stint in the road, but you might actually do much better going to the gym and exercising, getting the endorphins up, eating healthy, taking a low sugar diet, you know, that, and, and also talking to yourself a little bit more forgivingly. You know, hey, I'm going through a really hard time right now, of course you're feeling a little anxious, and that's okay. We will be right back with Emily Francis. And we are back with Emily Francis. I see the, uh, the married name on the new book. Her other book is From Fear to Faith. Yes. And uh, this is the st your, more of your personal this story. Is so Anxiety Sucks, I wrote it as a companion book. Hey, anxiety, what's it like? It sucks. It's like being trapped in hell in your head and you're not alone. So I write it from an upbeat, sort of humorous point of view. And it's just to let you know that you're not alone. Here's some body symptoms and let's see what we can do to help them. The From Fear to Faith is truly what I consider to this point my life's work. It is the years of falling down and getting back up, all the different places I went to in the name of healing, all the different avenues. So when I started writing From Fear to Faith, it was when I hit the bottom and realized mm. that I have a true problem and that I need to work through it. So the book, a lot of times I would read analytical books, you know, from the psychiatrist, here's how to analyze your way through anxiety, and I'd have to put it down because it was it didn't help me. Mm. And so I started writing From Fear to Faith because I didn't find any books that really let you know how hard it really is so that you don't feel as nuts when you start reading it and then you can come up and out with somebody and also to encourage people to try different modalities of healing because I think that's really important. What did the psychiatrist tell you when, the first time you saw someone? They told me that I had a post-traumatic stress from hmm. when my father passed away even though it was years later and he said you've done an unbelievable amount of work but there's a part of you that's still a grieving child and that and he's the one that he actually did give me medication I took a fourth of that pill I couldn't get out of bed for 24 hours I wow. felt like I was in a coma and I never took medication again that's why part of the reason I was so completely against medication and then he's the reason that I did the um, EMDR he he suggested that I do the eye movement desensitization reprocessing mm. which is for post-traumatic stress and and it was it was pretty cool I mean I wouldn't say that I walked away you know so what, what exactly how does that work this is how it works honestly the person sits in front of you and they hold these two fingers and they make you follow with your eyes and then they do this suggestion of what you should think about. And then the rest is really on you. So you sort of go into your own psyche and figure out what's going I'm gonna on. use that in my interviews from now on. It was like, <laughs> in my head it was like, I cannot believe I am paying so much money and I'm, mm. you know, it's almost like- What's that, like 300 an TV? hour or maybe more? Yeah, I don't know. Pendulum, you know <laughs> okay, start with this story. You know, and the lady that I, that I went to, I had already known this ahead of time that she was fairly new to the program, to the EMDR. She actually had the nerve to sit with me right before we get started. I've been to her several sessions. Now we're supposed to start with the execution of the EMDR and she says to me, this may not work because you're one of the worst I've ever seen. Okay, are you ready? And I said, no, wow. I'm not ready. <laughs> Are you telling me that you're a little a bit of a bombshell? And, yeah, you're one of the I'm worst. One of the worst that you've ever. I, I teach yoga. What do you mean? I'm one of the worst you've ever seen. And she says, 
does this bother you? I literally wow. started looking around. I thought maybe I was What on is she camera. like, Sybil or something? What is this? Like, is some what twisted? Kind of therapy? <laughs> and I honestly think it was just her way of covering her tracks. Hey, if this doesn't work, it's on you. It's not on me. I'm new to this. Wow. And I honestly, I came back the next session and I said, you know, I really have to address this with you. I thought that was a really unprofessional, inappropriate thing to start with. And there might even be a few other words to throw out there yeah, too, but I'm really, glad you didn't. I was really thrown off by that. I mean, how are you supposed to really sit and go, okay, let's really dive into my psyche when all I'm thinking, and hello, anxiety, all I'm thinking is, I'm the worst, I'm the worst, I'm the worst. You know, so it, was, it, oh, it wasn't my most successful healing <laughs> sessions ever, <laughs> um, but it, but I, do, I did have like a, a specific um, kind of a breakthrough meditation with my father that I did, I understood the concept that you are not honoring their life when you are constantly in pain and, and in fear. You honor their life by living your life. And that was hard for me to get. Grief is hard. Grief's a really hard thing to deal with and it can manifest itself in depression or anxiety or in a, any number of ways. And I really realized that a lot of my stuff just came to, I was, I was grieving and I didn't have an avenue to express that properly. Well, and I was thinking when you mentioned the first time when you said your father died, I was yeah. thinking, you know, these days that, well, at least in like the case of a school shooting or something or something, you know, they usually have grief counselors and things, right. whereas it sounds like back then they didn't want to talk about it, it but like these taboo. days it, it seems like, like people are more... None of us discussed this, and all of a sudden it was like we didn't talk about my dad anymore. And, you know, I have to say, I, I, on a side note and a personal note, I love being here today because it's my dad's birthday. And oh, it's a okay. wonderful way to honor him and to spend the day and, and to come into a place where I honor him now. And I understand that that grief was a huge part of who I have become, but it's not who I am. Well, and of course, you mentioned grief, which I'm sure must, you know, for it's, anyone's experience would be a crisis. huge one. But I know some of the other categories that were mentioned, such mm -hmm. as general, generalized anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, disorder post-traumatic stress disorder, which you mentioned, social anxiety disorder, anxiety and depression, various. Um, do you have what sense of which of those are the most common, though? I mean, is grief one of the more? Uh, grief is, I think grief is one of the the biggest contributors. I think it's actually the pusher that makes it come through to whatever makes your brain come off kilter. But um, generalized anxiety disorder is a daily occurrence. It doesn't mean that you have anxiety attacks every day, but you do have to cope with your daily living. Social anxiety disorder, you just are afraid to be in social situations. Uh -huh. So a lot of times what you see in people is they're, they're kind of negative. So mm -hmm. they'll really sort of dog on having to do something social, not really realizing that it's because it's their issue and they need to address it. How well, how well do people, I mean, again, it sounds like you've, as your psychiatrist said, have done so much work or really thought this out, and, and I give you a lot of credit, I mean, for having written the books and really just hit it head on. Um, but how many people, I guess what I'm saying is, do people live with it successfully, or is it a long-term? I mean, can you, I want to say, if cure it, or do you treat, you know, is it, what do they say, uh, managed, or do you? you manage. Okay, I, so honestly, there's. Honestly, I view it as more of like I'm in recovery. Hmm. And, and I don't mean to associate it with, with a different kind of disease, but it is something that, yes, you can live with it successfully. Hmm. But it doesn't, if you had it to the point where I had it. Now, if you had it where it's coming through and you had a hard time, it's gone and, and good riddance and goodbye and lucky for you hmm. that it's gone. But for the people like myself who went through a long period where anxiety really was the ruler of the roost, uh, you can live with it successfully and you can manage it, but it does not mean that it ever really leaves. Well, it was interesting to hear from you because I, you know, part of me wanting to believe in the mind over matter and everything, and I'm always a little bit suspicious because you hear so much about the problems these days with prescription drug medicine oh, and, and how people, but so I love the fact that, I mean, you know, it sounds like you were very conservative yourself and didn't, yes. but yet it's interesting to hear though that, you, but you still had to, you know, that it wasn't, it just, it wasn't just a physical, I'm sorry, honestly, that it wasn't just mental, that it was I a physical side too. I right? to go and get on medication and it felt yeah. a little bit shameful. And it is textbook for anxiety, uh, an anxiety person, they don't like to take pills. So yeah. medication scares them, everything scares them. Uh, uh. And so, it, you know, medication certainly does scare them. But I honestly, I felt like I failed and then had to try the medication to find out that guess what, it wasn't failing, it was actually coming into the realization that my brain was off balance. My mind is in check. I've done the work to control my mind and to get good coping skills and excellent self-talk. But sometimes that isn't enough and I just want people to understand that you're not alone. If you're anxious and you're having some issues, please find somebody that truly can take you down your correct avenue that will help you the best way possible. Well, thank you very much, so Emily much Francis. It was a pleasure. Emily's books are Anxiety Sucks and From Fear to Faith. Thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you.